Well, it is a cold, wet, miserable day here in the northeast of England. So, what better a day than to remain indoors and continue with your homebrew, your winemaking and other wonderful activities in the kitchen. Stay tuned for part five of AJ's Rhubarb Wine. See you in a minute. Well, hello and a very warm welcome back to The Life's Good. It's been a while. Um, as my regular followers know, I was in an accident uh, shortly after, about three days after making part four of the uh, rhubarb wine uh, series. And it's only in the recent weeks that I've been getting back to normal and able to continue doing things that I was doing prior to my accident. Now, I have been able to do a few things, obviously, and uh, I've been uh, sorting out some of the rhubarb wine. Um, this is my demijohn, full of rhubarb wine. Now, I explained in my last video about racking off, which is the method of decanting the wine from one demijohn into another clean demijohn in order to remove it from the sediment in the bottom of the jar. Now, I have actually racked this twice more since that video, um, which is a process of siphoning using your siphon wand and tubing, siphoning the wine from this demijohn into a nice, clean, sterile demijohn, leaving the sediment behind in the bottom here and then putting a clean sterile bung and airlock in the top and leaving it for a little longer. Now the last time that I did this was about a week ago, four or five days ago. I racked this into this demijohn and two days after I added a crushed Campton tablet. Now the Campton tablet it creates a barrier on the surface of the liquid. I believe that's sulfur or sulfur dioxide. I'm not entirely certain. I may be corrected on that. But the Campton tablet helps to prevent any fungus and bacterial growth uh, forming on the surface of the wine and will ultimately protect the wine when you bottle it. Now, the wine had all but finished fermenting at that point. There are no more bottle, uh, sorry, bubbles r rising through the liquid. Um, following the addition of the Campton tablet, I did swirl this a couple of times, but not violently enough to disturb the sediment. But it just helps get rid of any CO2 left in the wine here. So it was racked into here, Campton tablet added, swirled a few times and left to finally clear, which it is now ready for bottling. And I'm gonna lift you off the tripod as I've done in the past, and I'll bring you in close so you can see what the wine looks like just before I bottle it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any clear bottles. I've only got these sort of green colored ones. And they're not really dark, like you would get with some red wines. Um, they're sort of an opaque green. They're okay for this. Um, but people say, why do you use clean or what? Sorry, clear or why do you use green bottles? Well, apparently, the red wine, as there is in this demijohn, red wine can be affected by direct sunlight and bright light. 
it can help to taint it it can affect colorings it can bleach it a little bit um, I'm sure you know if you leave clothes photographs pictures that sort of thing in direct sunlight the pictures get bleached and apparently a similar thing happens to your wine so your dark wines your heavy reds and so on tend to be put into a dark green bottle which helps to sort of filter out some of that daylight um, it's also a good idea to keep them in a darkened place hence I suppose people use wine cellars they're cool and dark now the rhubarb wine I placed out in my shed for the few last few days where it was cool it was dark and this has cleared nicely now ready for bottling and I've got myself six of these bottles which I am going to sterilize and fill with wine but there's a little more to this process a little extra that I build in in order to avoid getting some of the last remains of sediment in these bottles I do actually rack the wine one further time into this clean sterile demijohn so that I've removed it from this sediment and then immediately I can then remove it from this demijohn into my bottles that helps me avoid getting all this crud that you get in the bottom of these wines in any of these bottles and the last thing you want is when you pour a bottle of wine out for your wife your girlfriend or for yourself or whoever your mum your granny whoever you're going to entertain with some of your lovely homemade wine you don't want to pour out a glass of wine that is full of bits and cloudy and spoiled so I take the wine off of the final sediment into the clean demijohn and then immediately from the demijohn into the bottles now I will take you through that process in a moment guys I'll explain exactly what I do at each of those stages so the next thing I'm going to do as I said I'll lift you off and let you have a close-up look at what's going on in the demijohn oh this is a bit closer to the demijohn so that you can see um, what sort of stage we're at with this um, as I said it's ready for bottling um, I'll see if I can get you in a bit closer guys just bear with me a minute let's see if we can do it there you go you should be able to note that here you can see there's absolutely no bubble activity this has completely finished fermenting there's no more activity here the surface does not have any bubbles on it although you do get a that is actually reflection of what's going on outside the uh, kitchen window that surface is absolutely still and clear and pink um, so it's completely finished fermenting now I'll try and lift you down a minute hang on right so I've just dropped you down and I hope the angle's good because the idea is I want you to see that this actually this wine is now absolutely gorgeously clear and i'm hoping i don't know if you can see this but you should just be able to make out my pen behind there you can see straight through that wine has got no sort of bits sediment floaters or anything in it um, it's a lovely pink color it's like a rose color that will look lovely in a glass and uh, as I said it's ready now to be put into bottles it's absolutely finished its fermentation it's lovely and clear and uh, now it's time to go to the next stage just a quick note on sterilizing um, sterilization is absolutely paramount when it comes to making wine and indeed other things you make in the kitchen I make beer we make jams we make chutneys pickles all manner of things sterilizing the equipment you use to make those products to store those products and, and to handle those products is absolutely paramount when it comes to the wine making there are several products available to us that we can use some I prefer 
some I don't. I'm sure if you go onto Google, onto YouTube, your local brew shop, magazines, books, there'll be lots and lots of information on sterilizing. I prefer the uh, powdered type um, sterilizing and cleaning agent. I buy this particular one. Um, th this is a Richie's. I'll just lift it up so you can see this. This is a, a, a large container. This is 500 grams. I do make a lot of beer and wine and jams and chutney, so I need a lot of sterilizing um, products in order to keep my equipment correct. Um, Richie's is, is one I like using. I get this from my local home beer and wine outlet. Um, very good, not the cheapest, but you buy it in bulk, it works out cheaper in the long run. I prefer that. Some people use the sort of the, the baby sterilizing type bleaching product. Um, fine, providing you rinse really, really well after using it. Um, there is a danger of an, a bleachy, chlorine aftertaste being left in plastics. Um, I'm not particularly keen on this one. People do use it with success, and yes, it will sterilize everything. Um, it's quite harsh, and as I said, the aftertaste is a danger. It's a chlorine-based cleaning product, sterilizing product. Um, fine if you've got nothing else available, but I prefer not to touch it. Now, other companies, um, supermarkets, I'm sure in America, Walmart do something, I'm not sure. There's lots of other companies. We have Wilkinson's, we've got um, the, your Spas and your, your, your other, what is it, Morrison's, Asda's and things like that. If they do a home brewing um, range, if there is a, a, a set of, uh, kits available from those stores. Very often you'll get some basic equipment available to you. And some of them have their own sterilizing product. This is a Wilkinson's one. Uh, it's a brew cleanse cleaner and sterilizer. It's the powder form and it's almost identical to the Richie's. Available in a smaller pot. There's a hundred grams in there. It does work out a lot cheaper. Um, than buying a branded product. Uh, the choice is yours, whatever you use, follow the instructions on the container and uh, be extremely careful how you go about using these. Um, I, as I said, prefer this one, so we don't need those. And um, in order to sterilize all of my equipment, to uh, continue with my bottling process today. I will use just one teaspoon of this product. I will make up about a liter of warm water solution. And I will use that to sterilize all that I'm going to use this morning to bottle my wine. I've got a one liter Pyrex jug into which I'm going to put a rounded teaspoon of the sterilizing powder granules product. And I've been running the tap, it's quite warm. That's some warm water there. I'm going to put in about a, just about a liter. There you go, that's fine about a liter of warm water in there guys and using the spoon that I've just used to count the uh, granules I'm going to give that a little stir up there we go it's as simple as that now you don't have to fill every vessel to the brim in order to sterilize it this demijohn you get four and a half, five liters of liquid in there. But in order to sterilize it using this product, all I do and all you need to do is to decant some of this from the jug. There we go. I've got about a hundred, 
200. In fact, it's, it's nearly 500 litres. That's a half, a, sorry, 500 millilitres, a half a litre I've put in there. And I'm going to put my hand on the, uh, the entrance hole there, onto the neck. And I'm going to give this a good shake and swirl around. And I allow some of it to pass by my hand and get around to the, the lip of the neck of the demijohn. So this area here gets coated with this liquid as well. Give it a swirl around. And I can stand that to one side for about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, you don't need to do it much longer, quarter of an hour. And uh, what I do is actually every couple of minutes or so, I just go back to it and give it another swirl. So that is the demijohn being sterilized. Now I'm going to be using my siphon tube and my siphon wand with the little attachment on the bottom that stops that bit of sediment being sucked up the tube and into the next vessel. Now, with these, much the same way. I notice there's a bit of powder left in the bottom of the uh, water, doesn't matter. But I pour some of that down in that tube, just coat it and stand it to one side in the sink. And then the actual hose, the, the flexible tubing, I'm going to pour some of this into that tube until it exits the far end. Just leave that sitting there with that liquid on, over and in that uh, flexible hose. Just going to give that a little stir just to break it up a bit. So my siphoning wand and hose are sterilizing. My demijohn crash. My demijohn is sterilizing. And you can do much the same with the bottles. You've still got this solution. You've got a couple of hundred mils of solution there. You can pour some into the bottle. Give it a swizz around. Let some get over the neck. And then I pour that back in there and stand the bottle to one side. Do the same with the next one. Some of the liquid going in. Give it a swizz around. Let it coat the neck as well. Pour it back in there. And stand it to the side. Let's move these out of the way for me. There you go. Now, that quantity of rhubarb wine is going to fill, I hope, six bottles. Um, approximately. You may find the last bottle, you don't quite fully fill it. That's a shame because that might mean you have to drink some. It's tough sometimes, isn't it? So there's another one. Coated in the sterilizing fluid. Now I have mentioned before, I don't have an issue with sensitivity. This liquid um, doesn't seem to affect my skin. I wouldn't want to leave it on my skin any length of time. I do rinse well. Um, but some people, if you do have sensitive skin or you have cuts or sores on your skin, it might be quite painful using some of this. Um, so uh, be cautious. If you do, if you are sensitive, wear some gloves, disposable gloves, marigolds, out you like. Wear something just to keep this from damaging you your skin. Now then, that's that one. I've got two more to go. Bear with me guys, it doesn't take long. Sterilizing your equipment does not have to take all day. It doesn't take long as long as you do it thoroughly within the instructions of the product you're using. The important thing is at the end of the day, you just need clean, sterile equipment in order that you don't spoil the end product. Right, now that is the last one of those. My demijohn over here, I'll give it another swirl. I'll 
I'm going to rinse my hands now. And that is it for now. Um, 10 or 12 minutes. I can rinse all this with cold water and we're ready to go. Well, now for the fun part. Um, I'm going to siphon the wine from the original jar into this clean, sterile and thoroughly rinsed demijohn. Now, I suppose you could use any vessel um, for this purpose. Um, I'm not going to be putting a bung in the top of this. I'm just using this as a temporary holding vessel to hold the wine in, in order that I don't transfer that sediment. So any container that you're able to sterilize, I suppose, would be suitable, providing you can then decant the wine from it into the bottles. So, um, we moved the bung and the airlock. This will now need to be cleaned. Uh, what I do actually, just a point of note, I always sterilize before I use, and very often I sterilize after use before storage, just to avoid any problems. Now remember, I made up this solution that is still usable. So the bubbler that I've just removed from there, I've just rinsed it under the tap, and the bung and the bubbler I'm now putting in that fluid. When you come to bottle the wine, I'm going to be using corks and I'm going to insert a cork in each bottle. These also will need to be sterilized. So I've got to the stage now where I'm decanting this and getting ready to bottle it. I'm now going to pop these corks in that solution. Give them a little bit of a dunk, get them covered, push them to one side. Excuse me. And by the time that I come to Put the wine in those bottles those corks would be nicely sterilized and slightly moistened in order to put them in those bottles now i'm going to rinse my fingers as they've been in that solution just bear with me a moment there guys and i'm going to insert the wand into the wine carefully so as not to disturb the last little bit of sediment in the bottom. And the fun part is to get this siphoning into here. Now at this point, you are able to taste your wine. So you'll get an indication of what its final fragrance, flavor, etc., is like. I almost didn't get that started, guys. I was forced to have a slurp. It's actually very lovely. It, uh, it tastes like a really pleasant rosé. So, it doesn't take long to siphon this wine into this demijohn prior to bottling. And all you have to remember is not to get that sediment the last little bit, there's not much in there, but you just don't want it in your bottles of wine. I do also try not to put the end of the hose that I've just had in my mouth in the wine in that jar. It's just propped inside the neck there. It's pouring down the side of the glass into there. It, it always strikes me as odd that we go through all that process of sterilization and cleanliness and hygiene. And at the last minute, the last thing you do before you put it into the next clean vessel is you put the hose in your mouth. Very strange. We're almost there. And what I'm going to do is as it gets to the bottom, I just tip 
this jar forward. Just keeping an eye on things. I know that this will not overflow in here. They're the same size. I keep an eye on things, make sure everything's moving well. And as we get to the bottom, I am just tipping this forward, holding it with my hand. Hope I'm not obstructing you too much, guys, but as you can see, it doesn't take long. And we've got the last little bit, just tease it out without getting all that crud into the next demijohn. Now I can see a few bits of cloudiness there. They're not quite going in and that's it. It's now finished siphoning. Now I'm just going to remove the hose, lift it up and allow the last bits to go into there. Now then, I'm going to use this hose immediately with the one, so I'm not going to rinse it or anything else. Just got to keep it to one side. Um, I'm just going to shake that wand a little bit. Now, what I wanted to do was to show you what is left in the bottom of this demijohn. There is a very small amount of sediment in there. Hope you can see that. Very tiny amount, but you just don't want that in your wine. As you can see, you swirl it around. It's a very milky, cloudy, yucky looking liquid. You just don't want that in your bottles, spoiling everything. So I'll get set up now for the next stage. I now have my demijohn of lovely rosé rhubarb wine waiting to be siphoned into bottles. I've rinsed all the bottles. They're sitting there on that step. That, that little steps is ideal. Well, I'll just walk around here as you can see. It's just a little set of household steps. Um, and they're absolutely ideal for this purpose. I've got the demijohn sitting on the work surface. The bottle's a little bit below and my siphon tube ready in order to siphon the wine into these bottles. I'll pop you up on the tripod guys and let you see what I'm doing. Okay, so we're almost there. Um, I'm now going to siphon the wine from this jar into my six wine bottles. And once again, we're using our siphon kit. Now I'm using the wand, but I'm not using the little sediment uh, catchment device in the bottom. I've taken that off. I don't need that. There is no sediment in here. This can be pushed down inside there right to the bottom and left to rest in the bottom. You don't have to worry about anything being sucked up and spoiling your wine. So that can go in there. And I hadn't pointed out earlier, I do use a little tap on the end of my hose. Now this has been uh, sterilized in my jar of sterilizing solution and it's been thoroughly rinsed. Um, it's a simple little tap. I'll just pull it off and show you. And if the uh, tap is in line, it's open, the wine will flow. And if you turn it crossways like that, it's closed, the wine will not flow. And that is a great aid when siphoning into bottles because you can turn off the flow, you can control and regulate the flow, and then once it's off, you can transfer it to the next bottle, open it and start again and slow it down at the end. So we now need to start the siphoning process into my six bottles that are sitting here. And once again, I'm likely to get another taste of this gorgeous rhubarb wine. Right. Oh, it is absolutely gorgeous, guys. This hose is now full of wine. And all I'm going to do is aim the tap into one of these bottles. I'm going to open the tap and allow that wine to flow. And you want to fill it until you're about an inch and a half or so from the top of the bottle. 
You certainly need to leave enough room for the cork. Um, you need to have a little air gap there. And uh, as this gets close to the surface, you just ease the tap back, slow it down as I'm doing now. I know you can't see, I am turning it down. The flow is slowing down. It's now a very small trickle. Right, and that is now stopped. What I'm going to do, I'll just lift that over to one side, guys. It's not going anywhere. I'm going to pick this bottle up and show you that um, I have now filled this to about this level. So when the cork goes in, there will be a small amount of air between the surface of the wine and the bottom of the cork. And that is one bottle of wine waiting to be corked. So I will crack on and do the other five bottles now and show you me putting the corks in in a moment. Well, we actually ended up with five full bottles of wine and the last bottle was about three quarters full. Now this wine is ready for drinking now. So I'm sure my wife and I will enjoy the part bottle this evening and these five I will be corking. What we haven't touched on today and I really do need to speak about is uh, how we go about calculating the strength of this wine. And I'm quite sure some of my viewers are actually thinking now, how strong is this? Um, what's it like? Well, there is the wine in a wine glass. It's a very light pink rosé colour. It smells exactly how you would expect wine to smell. It's got that little hint of rhubarb about it. It's not overly sweet and it's certainly not dry. That is a lovely medium rosé, drinkable at any time. Um, you might want to accompany some fish dishes with this or it's not quite sweet enough for a pudding wine, but it wouldn't complement steak, let's put it that way. A robust meal needs a robust wine. This wouldn't suffice but this is certainly quaffable, beautiful. Um, the strength we calculate using specific gravity. And I think I did point out at the early stages that on the back of my label, I wrote the original gravity of this wine. And I checked that using the hydrometer, a little jar, and a quantity of the wine. And I floated the hydrometer in that. And you take a reading. Now it starts off floating quite high. And as the wine ferments and creates alcohol, the specific gravity is lowered. And this now is sitting in this. And I'm able to read that the specific gravity now is 0.090. The original gravity was 1.080. Now we perform a calculation. We take the final gravity from the original gravity and we multiply it by 0 0.129. Now I have done that and I've calculated that this wine has an alcohol by volume of approximately 10%. So it's on a par with your normal wines that you get from the shops, which range from 10, 11, 12%. Some of your more robust wines and your ports and so on, they're a lot stronger. But uh, as a, a drinkable wine, this is no slouch at 10%, maybe a fraction over, but uh, pleasantly strong enough to, uh, to make you mellow, I would say and set a mood. So, very pleased with that. It's a lovely colour, lovely flavour. It's the right strength. And I quickly, before I go, need to show you how I pop the corks into these bottles. 
I hope you can see me all right from over there, guys. Um, putting corks in bottles. Now, I did say earlier I had some corks, which I'm going to put into my bottles, and I've sterilized them and rinsed them. A, that's made them clean, and B, it's made them a little bit moist, which takes it, makes them a bit easier to put into the bottles, to be honest. Um, I've got those ready. Now, there's all manner of gadgets you can buy to put corks into wine bottles. Somebody gave me this one. Um, it looks very complicated. The idea is you open it, you lift the lever, you open it up, your cork actually goes inside here. You clamp it as best you can, put it on top of the bottle and press down. I find this very clumsy. I don't get on with it very well at all. I do have a little bit of arthritis in my wrists and thumbs and I find this one very awkward and quite painful to use. There are lots of other gadgets on the market. You can go and have a look around your local brew shops, look online on your Ebays, your Amazons and places like that and see what gadgets you prefer or that you'd like to try. These are for putting proper corks into wine bottles. Now you can get different corks. Um, some like these ones, I'll bring them up to show you. Uh, they're, they're just a cork with a plastic top. Sometimes these you can push in and then twist off. They're quite successful. I sometimes use these style with my beer bottles because you can just grab hold of it, give it a twist and pull it out. They're quite useful. You can get all plastic ones. They need to be well cleansed and well sterilized and then they push into your bottle. They're quite effective. Not quite the same as a traditional cork, but again, I've used them. They're successful. They're just not as aesthetic. So there's all sorts of ways of stopping the bottle. Now I have this gadget for using with my normal corks. It's a lever operated machine. I'll do that again for you. It's lever operated. If you look from this side, you've got a hole in here where you put your cork in and put it on the bottle, you lever down. These little clamps attach to the sides of the bottle. The plunger then forces the cork into the neck of the bottle. I like using this one, it's ideal for me. If I'm not using these um, push-in type corks, the plastic and otherwise, I will use a standard cork. And in here, I'll just show you what I do. The cork goes in that little gap there. And then you're levering down. I'll put it up to the bottle, like so. You can just make that out. It's sitting on top of the bottle. The cork is in there. The plunger's pushing the cork down. As you lever down, these little claw shapes grip the bottle. And with a final press, you push the cork all the way down. I stand it on a cloth on the work surface to avoid any skidding and sliding. You don't want to be dropping this on the floor and smashing your bottles at this stage after all your hard work. Lever back, lift it off, and as you can see, quite simply, that cork has been pressed into this bottle, nicely finished off. You get a little indentation sometimes in the top, that's not a problem. But that bottle of wine is now corked and ready for storage. Now I do stand them for a day or two before I lie them down. People lie bottles of wine down in order that you keep them, the cork moist, it stays sealed. You don't get any air in and anything else that's going to spoil the wine. It's always a good idea to lie them down if you're going to keep them a long time. But for a couple of days, I will stand these and allow those corks to set in the neck. They dry out a little bit. They will seal themselves in. And uh, of course, you will need a corkscrew to remove them. But that bottle is now made ready for storage. I'll go through it once more. There's the next one. Here's my gadget. I pop my cork in the top, bring it down so the plunger's just touching the cork on top of the bottle. 
one hand either side it's clamping the bottle and a little bit more of a push it is a bit hard sometimes guys here she goes i can feel her slipping in you don't want to go mad because you don't want to be cracking necks off of bottles that one's gone all the way home again lift it off carefully and that bottle is now also fully corked little dent in the top doesn't matter that is now sealed so we have some lovely bottles of wine corked as i said stand them for a couple of days let the corks set and then you will want to keep these lying down in a wine rack other area anywhere you've got space you've got preferably not too hot i would keep them in a cool dark area um we're lucky we have an area in our utility area and uh, we have a small wine rack in there and we pop all our wine in that sometimes i store them on top of our kitchen cupboards and uh, it's nice sometimes when you're dusting and decorating you come across a, a lovely bottle of wine that's been there for a good few months now the thing is with this wine it is ready to drink now i did say that earlier it is ready for drinking however once it's bottled if you store it for a little while it does improve with age the flavors become more rounded i think is the uh, the term um everything about the wine becomes more mature and more settled that is very very new nouveau nouveau vin i might say um so yeah have some now if you wish i'm certainly going to be partaking of a little of this this evening um, the lovely Cheryl is at work today. I told her I was going to be uh, bottling the wine and she said, "Ooh, any chance we could try some this evening? And I said, yes, of course we can. So, success. It's a long time. Good few weeks, good few months. It's well worth the effort, I think, if you've got a produce at the end of your effort and time that you can enjoy like this that hasn't cost the earth to produce uh, and that's the thing that the rhubarb's in the garden didn't cost me anything for the rhubarb the sugar i purchased the water comes out of the tap i've got bottles which we reuse i've got demijohns which i reuse all my other equipment i reuse the more you use it the more times you go through that process then the original outlay for equipment becomes minimal compared to the worth or the value of the product that you get at the end of the day guys homemade wine homemade anything it's got to be done and that's why we call it the good life or the life's good rather um, we enjoy home produce homemade pickles jams wines beers you name it and uh, yeah success i'll drink to success mm. honestly if you could taste that now well guys look thank you once again for sticking around it's been a long one today but i wanted to get this finished it's been a while the wine was desperate to be bottled we've done that and uh, i can now move on and look at other things It'd be interesting to hear your comments if you've got any comments to make on what i'm doing here please 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 do make them i do read all comments that are made on my videos good or bad i really don't mind i take on board any criticism um, welcome any comments you have to make i have got in the corner here another demijohn of bramble wine or blackberry wine i am going to be making some more of that using blackberries that we have foraged earlier this year they are currently in the freezer please let me know if you'd like me to go through making the blackberry wine or the bramble wine as i call it let me know and maybe i'll do a series of making my next batch of bramble wine i really don't mind it's a good thing to do blackberries in hedgerows along the roadside long country lanes everywhere blackberries are there for the picking they're free to collect make a fantastic wine and believe me that is a very very good wine it's a very nice 
fairly full-bodied red wine. Guys, I'm going to have to go. I could ramble on all day. It, as I said, it's been a long video today. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, one person who commented this last week. Uh, Wayne. Wayne Hill. I don't know where you're from, Wayne. I do appreciate your comments. And uh, Wayne was asking if there was going to be another episode or part five to the rhubarb wine. Yes, there is. Here it is. Uh, but something Wayne mentioned in his comment was, have I made banana wine? Well, to be perfectly honest, I'd never heard of banana wine until Wayne mentioned it. And um, there are some recipes out there. There are some YouTube videos about banana wine. I will be doing some research. And you never know, maybe we will have a recipe for AJ's banana wine sometime in the future. Doesn't sound particularly intriguing to me. I, I think I think I might fight shy of banana wine, but certainly your hedgerow wines, your fruit wines, gotta be done. Well, guys, you take care. Be safe. Be happy. Cheers.